purpose of the National Electric Code. There's nothing more important than understanding why do we have a National Electric Code? And so let's get into some of the language in there. And it's, it's brought out in the very first rule. 90.1 talks about the purpose of the National Electric Code. Let's look at the illustrations. We're not going to be talking, we're not going to be showing the code book hardly at all in this program. We're just going to be showing graphics that represent that. So let's read the language here. And what you can do is put, your, put the video on pause, get your code book out, read it, watch the video, play it back again, read it, look at the textbook, work around there, and slowly, but first thing, go through it quickly, come back at least a second time, at least a second time and probably at least a third time, and then you're going to really understand. You get chapters one through four nailed, you're going to be so much further ahead than almost anybody else in the electrical industry. So let's read the actual graphic here, right? The purpose of the NEC. The purpose of the NEC is the practical safeguardings of persons and property from hazards arising from the use of electricity. If you took your code book, if you were going to highlight something, I'd underline the word practical safeguardings. Listen, you can get killed in a car. Yeah, you have airbags and seat belts and everything else like that, but that doesn't mean you're not going to get killed. You can't make an electrical system where it's going to be perfection and it's going to be perfect. There's no such thing as a safe electrical system, but we want to make sure that we install it per the National Electric Code, install it in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions of the product. And if we do that, if we did it perfect, it would be safe. For the instant that you just finished it, but then of course, a, a day go by and somebody drove into something, and somebody moved something and something got loose and it wasn't maintained. An electrical system from the moment you finish it is beginning now to fail. And what we want to do is install things in a method that when they fail, they fail safely. So this is talking practical. You could look at a code rule and say, well, you know what, they should require this and they should require this and they should require that. And maybe they should, but maybe it's not practical. So. Don't think an electrical system is safe. It's as safe as practically we can do. So let's go back to the text. The purpose of the NEC is the practical safeguarding of persons and property from hazards arising from the use of electricity. The code is intended, I'm sorry, is not intended as design specification or an instruction manual for untrained persons. I remember the first time I was in a trade. I was in a trade a week and there was a code book about actually this size, right? And sitting on the dash and it was all white because what? It was faded from the sun. And I got the code book out, and I opened it up, and I went to probably Article 100 definitions or, or some crazy thing, and I read it, and, and, and I got done with the page, and I don't remember what I read. I mean, I, I, listen, you can't just get the code book. That's why we have this video. That's why we have the book. It's not, uh, it's not an instruction manual. It's not a design. Engineers are going to design things to meet the customer's needs. Okay? So we move on now. Adequacy of the code. The code contains requirements necessary for a safe installation that's essentially free for electrical hazards. Well, there is no such thing as a safe electrical installation. But it's practical safety and, and it's essentially free from electrical hazards. Well, essentially free means essentially you could take a plane across the ocean and essentially you should make it. That doesn't mean planes don't go down. Same thing here. But, it, but so it's essentially free from electrical hazards, but not necessarily efficient, convenient, adequate for good service or future expansion of electrical circuits. And as we, you, you can, we'll have to think of, not necessarily for efficiency. Can you think of anything efficiency, guys, or convenience, not a convenient? Any, anything? Give me some examples here as to what, <coughs> Brian, some well, I mean, uh, there's many, many times that you'll have a specification for a piece of equipment that requires to have exact parameters for voltage, and the NEC may not require a wire size large enough to support that because the machine's got a very small tolerance. Medical equipment, for instance, with imaging, you have to have a specific size wire for an X-ray machine that's having to do with the machine. It's not an NEC requirement because the NEC is only worried about us catching things on fire or shocking people. But the x-ray equipment requires to have the larger conductor because of inrush and imaging and precision. So you have to follow other information. Right. Uh, Mario, you going to say something? Yeah, no, I was just going to mention in a commercial office with one receptacle. Oh. Yeah. The code doesn't require receptacles in a commercial building. Not at all. Not at well, all. that's not convenient. <laughs> not convenient. <laughs> not convenient. You might want to add a couple here. <laughs> it's not adequate. It's not great for future use or good service. 
Who doesn't care? All it cares what? We're not going to kill you. Eric? Yeah, another example is uh, motor feeder circuits. You can design a motor feeder circuit with multiple motors from the NEC, but you'll never be able to expand it. And so we don't usually do that. Well, yeah, so listen. We don't care if it's convenient. We don't care if it's adequate. We don't care if it's efficient. We don't care if it's going to be good for future use. All we care is that what? It's going to be safe. Oh, it's going to be practically safe. Joel? One other good point is... dies, or a circuit breaker dies, as long as it dies properly without causing a fire to the building. Okay, let's move on now. Adequacy of the code, this is a note. Did we already explain notes and articles and all that other stuff before? No, 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 no. no. Would we have done that? We will have done that Saturday when we do that. That's what I'm saying. So, therefore, I will have assumed that they already know yes. what a note is, okay. what the articles are. Well, we're going to get to notes in, in uh, 90.5C. Well, we're going to have lots of notes, but by the time the watcher watches the video this far, we're going to record on Saturday the whole part about what an article is, what's new, what the shading is. Okay. So, so I have, have to that. know that we've already done that. The guy's already seen how to use a code book, how the code is structured, what notes are, informational notes, what are notes at tables, you know, what are exceptions, you know. He knows the structure. You with me? Code, yeah. So when I yeah, come yeah. over here and I say note, I'm like, ooh, I haven't explained that. Have we? Have we? And the answer, Brian is saying, yes, we will have done that when it comes digitally because we're doing that on Saturday. Right. You right can now. put your nonlinear cap on. My tie. Okay, I'm ready. So I'm going to do the note again, Brian. Yep. Okay. Looking at this slide right here. This is 90.1B note, and as we discussed in, in the structure of the code, the way it's structured, the code is structured, there are notes that are contained, or informational notes. We just call them notes in our textbook and notes in our slides just to make it a little shorter. These are not code rules. This is just information. So here's an informational point that's being made in 90.1B, and here's what it says. It says, hazards may occur when the initial wiring does not include provisions for system changes or for an increase in the use of electricity. So the code is just giving some information. Look, we can't tell you to design something for the future and for adequate service, but we're giving information. If you don't consider the future use and adequate service, well then, you know, there could be some problems later on. So that's what the informational note is about. Let's go to 90.1C and a note. So we have two things here. This is a rule as well as a note is combined in a single graphic. And here's what it says. The NEC addresses the safety principles contained in the IEC standard, such as. So, anybody know what an IEC standard is, guys? Anybody here? International, International Electrical, Electrical Commission. Electro Who knows Commission. a little bit more about that? Just a real short version. So, there's an. Is this this is an international standard that they've established, applied to all the different codes and standards. And here's what it says: We want you to protect against electric shock protect against the adverse thermal effects, against excessive current called overcurrent, against fall currents, and against overvoltage. So these are factors that the code is saying that we want to comply. So the NEC is designed to integrate with other international standards for the practical safeguardings of persons and property arising by the use of electricity. So let's move on now. Let's talk about the, the different concepts. One is fires. Well, fires can be caused by failure of an electrical system, and the code gets involved in fires about fire penetration and keeping smoke out of places, because last thing you want to do is have a fire somewhere, even if it's not an electrical fire, but then that smoke is going through chases where electrical systems are being installed. So the code is worried about both the electrical system causing a fire, but also how to manage um, smoke in the event of a fire. It, it's concerned about electric shock, electrocution. Be careful. I used this term once before until somebody corrected me. I used the word, I was electrocuted once. And the guy says, no, you were never electrocuted. Just, I was. You don't know what I'm saying. I was electrocuted. It was really bad. He goes, no, you weren't electrocuted. <laughs> electrocuted means what? You would have been dead. <laughs> so you didn't get electrocuted. You got shocked. Okay. I'm like, okay. So electric shock or electrocution. So 
Those of you watching the videotape, you've been, this video, you've never been electrocuted. Okay, it also deals with arc flash and arc blast. And let's talk about protection against fires. Here's an example of probably, actually it is. Oops, let me go back here. Oh, what happened? I'm trying to, trying to zoom in on that. This is, if you look over here, a ground fault circuit interrupter. GFCIs, okay, or electronic devices. Electronic devices all fail. Everything has an end of life. I mean, my prayer is going to be gone one day, and, and everybody, the whole deal, none of us getting out alive. Well, there's not an electrical piece of equipment that's going to survive forever. And since it's going to fail, there's going to be an end of a life. Now, we don't know what happened here in this case here. Uh, maybe there was a fault inside. There could have been an over-voltage condition. There could have been a lightning strike outside. And maybe a solution or a way of protecting that would have been surge protection, which we'll talk about that. And so whatever it was, there was a failure here. And if this had continued on, it possibly could have resulted in a fire. So how do we protect against fires? Well, you can use what is called an arc fault circuit interrupter. That's relatively new. I think it started in 1999 in the National Decode. So it's relatively new as far as 100 something years go by. And guess what it is? Look at these electronics. Here's electronic uh, circuit breaker. Look at this receptacle. By the way, you cannot put an AFCI receptacle back together again. Just didn't know that. <laughs> because when they first came out, I got like one of the first in the, on the planet and as soon as I got it, I took it apart. And then, of course, all the springs and all the things and everything falls apart. I'm like, okay, I'm not putting that back together again. But look at the electronics on that. I mean, this is amazing. Well, guess what? You can have transients. You can have voltage spikes. All of a sudden, that, that, there's a failure in there, and that can result in it. Now, the purpose of an ASCI is to be, we'll talk about this, is to sense arcing that could cause a fire and to protect against that. Here's an example of what is called a glowing termination or glowing contact, and this is showing it at 25 times the speed. And notice this conductor, and look at the arcing that's taking place right here. Now, nothing can sense that, and nothing can from initiating into a fire. There's no device. So as much as we have AFCIs, which we'll talk about, and we have GFCIs, and we have effective ground fault current paths, and we have all these code... If you have a loose connection, it's called a glowing termination. It will heat up and heat up and heat up until ultimately, hopefully, it would fail in a way that something will sense that and will protect against that. But it doesn't always happen in there. So electrical systems are not ever safe. But what are we going to do? You know, we can become K people? You know, I don't think so. Fires from improper conductor termination. Here's an example. I'm sure everybody here, and I don't know, I'm just curious of you guys. Honestly, you ready? How many guys have put more than one wire under a lug? Okay, that's 100%, just so you know, in case you don't know the math. And girls. Even, even, and, and guys. And girls. It, yeah, and, girl. and girls. And girls. Isn't guys a girl? Can I say a guy? You can say guys. I'm okay with that. He's an electrician. Yeah. Okay, we're electricians. Okay, so we're guys. Okay, so 100%. In case you don't know math well, if everybody raise a hand, that's 100%. Just, just between us, we can work that out. Okay, so that 100% have done this. But now, of course, we're all high and mighty now. Like, well, you don't put two wires under a log. Blah, blah, blah. Well, number, okay, there's a couple of reasons why we did it. One, we're not working in the field anymore, and we were working in the field at a long time. And the practices, the, we didn't think about safety. We were thinking about mechanically terminating, getting this wire placed in, and we didn't understand the ramifications that if this terminal was designed for a single conductor, there's torquing considerations, there's wire sizing, there's, it, it's designed for a specific purpose, and we did not understand that you can't do that. So what do you have to do? Well, you're going to have to make sure you use terminals that maybe, look right here, um, Make sure that, you, well, this is three wires. Well, no, it's, three, it's at least three. three well, it's three wires. There's no way you're going to save this puppy. I mean, we're going to have to take one wire out of each of these, go into a wireway, go into a piece of equipment, and then go into a power distribution block, and then make connections. But that's what the whole purpose of this program is, to teach you to understand the products and the standards and how to make this safe. This is called a haircut. Okay, if you see right here. Somebody cut the strands. Now, this is like beyond belief that anybody would have done this. Okay. How many of you guys have given a haircut? 
Why are you going to keep asking these questions? Come on. Yeah. Okay. Put it on the spot, Mike. Okay. Even the girl did. Okay. Joe, you didn't do it. You didn't. No. You didn't. Why? Because you didn't have a scenario? I ordered the right lug. Oh, please. Oh, boy. Yes, I did. You really yeah. did? Yes. Okay. So 99% of the people out there have done haircuts. And that's a major problem because we didn't understand. And we're, we're electricians. We're in the field. We're trying to get the job done. We're not properly trained. And, and so we just, and we've seen it. So obviously that's what you do. I mean, because we've seen it before. So that's going to be a big no-no and a big fire. So let's talk about protect against electric shock and electrocution. Without getting into the details here, here's where electricity leaves the power supply, goes through the circuit, and it goes to the light bulb, and it comes back over to the circuit. And then somebody makes contact between, let's say, an energized conductor, and they're somehow making contact, let's say, to the earth, and it's a conductive path using the earth as a return path for a solidly grounded system. And current travels from the hand through the heart to the foot all the way back. This was discussed in electrical fundamentals, and that reminds me. Before, you really should be watching this videotape right now. You should have completed my electrical fundamentals course. The National Electric Code is, is a law to accommodate physics because, hey, this happens, that happens, this happens, and that's how electrons work. So then for we write rules. You're not going to understand the National Electric Code, and you're going to be doing a disfavor to yourself if you have not stopped the video, stopped the book, put this away, contact my office, order the fundamentals program and watch that so then when you get into the code it's like boom 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 so we're assuming that you understand electrical fundamentals in this program here so this is covered in electrical fundamentals and how people get shocked we're concerned about that here's a soldier in iraq that was killed what was going on there he just turned on a shower that's all he did turn on a shower and he got killed here's a young uh, man this was Miami, a young boy, I think he was like 12 years old, something like that, and you can read the text in there. He just sat down on one of the bus shelters, took off his shoes because it was raining, boom, got killed. All he, did was just, all he did was get out of the rain to go sit in there and he got killed. Okay. Uh, here's a $50 million case for electrocution. Somebody going in, uh, swimming out in, in, a, in a boat dock or a marina. Young girl, this is North Carolina. I think in R Raleigh, I think it was Raleigh, North Carolina, yeah, it was Raleigh. And all she did was the first day of job as a lifeguard, she got killed. She didn't do anything. She just was getting water, checking the chemicals. Uh, New York young girl, Jody Lane, uh, she was in New York City. She was walking her two dogs. That's all she was, just walking her dogs. And all of a sudden, she gets killed inside here. So the National Dakota is concerned about that. It's trying to make sure we have electrical systems. So when they fail, they fail safely. And of course, what's protecting persons and property. That would include dogs or cats. That would include cows or livestock. So the National Institute Code in Chapter 5, Article 547, there are, are, there are rules there for agricultural buildings. All right, so now, how do we protect against electric shock? We saw the AFCI could maybe help reduce an arcing fault, but it can't prevent against a glowing terminal fault. Uh, electric shock, we, again, it's covered in fundamentals. You all know all about electric shock and the whole thing, so we're not covering it now. And then we have GFCI devices. And if you see a GFCI devices, they're designed to protect people. And they come into, let's say, a, a receptacle, maybe a, what is called a facelift, a faceless, faceless GFCI. Here's a GFCI circuit breaker. And then, of course, you have these uh, little accessory kits that you can just plug inside here. Look at this GFCI, and we've seen it a little earlier there. Look at the elect. Oh no, that was AFCI. Look at the electronics. Guess what happens to GFCIs? Guess what happens to AFCIs? They have an end of the life, and their end of the life is, I'm going to say, I'm going to pick a number, guys. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. I'm going to say it's ten times shorter than a typical electrical product. A AFCI guys and a GFCI. Do you think its life would be ten times less than a circuit breaker? or a disconnect, Absolutely. or yes. a piece of pipe, uh, yes. because it's electronic, Electronics. right? I mean, as a matter of fact, the National Code in the 2020 Code is requiring surge protection on dwelling units because you have smoke detectors, GFCIs, AFCIs, and you have these high transients. They go into these electronics, and it smokes them. But here's the problem generally, but we'll talk about this in specific later on. You start losing, and you're wiping out the electronics. 
you might still have electric power there. You just don't have the protection. So you never want to depend on a GFCI or an electronic device to provide any kind of personal protection. It's just like the suspenders. You still get your belt, but it's a little extra. So the danger of electricity is the electric shock where somebody's operating on a piece of equipment, making a connection to a surface, and then that current leaves the source, travels to the person, and it returns back over to the source. So that's a hazard. Now, GFCIs, we talked about that. We're not going to get into the electronics and how the circuitry operates because we covered this in electrical fundamentals, how the circuit operates. So we're not going to be spending any time on that. So you better know how a GFCI operates. Now, another way to protect people, which is a little bit more mechanical rather than electronic, is going to have an effective ground fault current path. This is also covered in, electron, in the electrical fundamentals program, and that is that we want to be able to trip the breaker. So here's what it would look like. You have electrons leaving the source, going through a meter, then they go to the main breaker, come over to a panel, then they go over to an outlet, then you go over to what is called the ground fault. So there's a failure of the phase conductor to the enclosure, and that electrons are always going back to the source, traveling on the equipment grounding conductor, the main bonding jumper across here, back over to the service neutral, and it gets back here. And what's going to happen is, hopefully, that breaker that's supplying that given load will trip. But possibly, the main breaker will trip. There, there, there are reasons that we covered that in fundamentals. Well, why would the main breaker trip, and why would... The, the 20 amp breaker at the load not driven. Well, it's called selective coordination, and it's, it's how things work in that case. But that's covered in fundamentals. So if you have proper equipment bonding, which is required by the code, and you have an effective ground fault current path, well, in the event of a ground fault, the protection device is going to open, and what that's going to do is it's going to remove the fault. So that's another way. Now, this is covered in fundamentals, but this is also going to be covered in great detail. As soon as you finish up, Chapters 1 through 4, you only see. We really need you to go chapters 5 through... Brian, did they do 5 through 8, or they do bonding and grounding next? They're going to do bonding and grounding next. Okay. They're going to do 5 through okay, 8. Okay, so you're going to do 1 through 4 now. Then you're going to get the bonding and grounding library. And you're going to do bonding and grounding. And that's really going to explain to you what I just described here. And then you're going to go 5 through 8, and there's a whole se sequence of steps after that. Each video will tell you what to do next. All right. Okay, now this is going to be fun. A bolted fault like we saw there, that will not happen in the real world except on an original installation that somebody made a mistake. Right? You, you mm -hmm. put the wrong wire. And then you turn on the breaker, it doesn't start, and you're in a, what's going on, and you go back there and you find it, oh, here it is, and you fix it. What could happen is, often happen, these wire connectors here, they melt. Poor connection inside there, gets resistance. You follow the logic there? And it melted. Now, I'm just going to use an example of a wire, and watch what I'm doing. I'm just going to have it sit there. You with me? So, I mean, that's like not even making any contact at all. I'm pretty confident that wire is actually going to do something, and we're probably not going to trip the breaker, because, Dave, what size breaker do we have on that, baby? 50. So it's a 50 amp breaker, which means it needs a lot more current. We really need an effective ground fault current path here, so let's see what happens. All right. Okay, personally, that didn't excite me. I mean, I was hoping the wire would melt, the thing, the wire didn't get hot, the insulation didn't melt, but guess what it did? It tripped the 50 amp breaker, which means it's safe. So that's all you have to do is ensure that there is an effective ground fault current path. And, and that is accomplished here because if you notice, that was the equipment grounding conductor coming in, taking back over there. So that's the number one step the electricians have to do. But there can be failures in that equipment grounding conductor. And we'll talk more about that and what the consequences of that. Okay, so that's a short video just demonstrating that if you have a ground fault, which is defined by the National Electric Code, and it's connected to equipment that's connected to an effective ground fault current path, which is defined by the National Code, and you're going to be learning that later on, that what's going to happen is you're not going to have something energized. It's going to just simply clear the fault.
that's another way to provide protection against electric shock. But you have to make sure that the electrical system has an effective ground fault current path. So we finish chapters one through four, get the book and the video on bonding and grounding, watch that, and then you'll understand what it takes. And here's just a young boy in Miami uh, who got shocked because that wire right there, he got shocked in a swimming pool, actually, this young boy. He was in a swimming pool in Miami. And that one wire right there, the electrician failed to place it under that wire connector. And he died. Mario? Yeah, I just think this that slide right there is, is, is really come to life because just one loose wire nut and you could kill somebody. So it's really important what we do um, to do things right, take pride in your work. Yeah, you, you're not, listen, nobody who did that installation thought that there was even the slightest possibility that they're gonna kill somebody because they got distracted. Listen, those of you that are watching the video, you are a professional. You're going to be the leaders of this industry. You need to take pride in what you're doing and the workmanship that you're doing and the people that you're associating with because what you're doing could possibly hurt you or maybe you're going to kill somebody else. Brian? Well, and, and I just want to make a statement here because I don't actually care how careful you are. We're all human and we make mistakes. I will tell you this. I don't take shortcuts. I've never taken shortcuts. It's not in my personality to take shortcuts. For sure, I know I have missed wires because I've gone back after I've made up, oh, yeah. you know, a 10,000 square foot building full of ceiling lights and wonder why that row of lights isn't working and you troubleshoot it and come back to a box and you go to pull down the joint and a wire pops out and it was never actually all the way in. We're humans, we make mistakes, but what we really need to do is focus on doing the best job we can possibly do and, and install it for the National Very Electrical important. Code and hopefully that will be keeping it more safe. Appreciate that. All right, let's move on. Protection against arc flash and arc blast. Working on energized equipment. Here's a video showing you that if you don't understand the potential hazard of electricity, and the National Code is not really into personal protective equipment, that's another standard which we'll be talking about, just understand the power that's available. immersed. Number one, you should not be working on anything that's energized. That's number one, period. Ever. <coughs> and while you're not working on something that's, while you are not working on something that's energized, you want to make sure you have equipment on just in case it was supposed to be turned off and it wasn't turned off. So let's just start it right from now, from the get-go. We're in Article 90. We haven't got very far in the code book. We haven't actually got into the code rules other than untrained persons and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Listen, electricity is dangerous. Make sure that you work things safely. And we're going to make a separate video on how to work electrical equipment safely. And, and Jennifer... You're going to help me with the team put together something simple that's practical, Ryan, that the electrician is going to look at that and say, you know what? I hadn't thought about that. You know, that's a, that's a good point. So not part of this understanding NEC, but we'll touch a little bit where the code touches it. But we want to put together something so you don't put yourself in a situation. Of course, that's just a demonstration. All right, let's move on to ensuring equipment can be can manage available fault. Here's an example of a piece of equipment having a fault, but the equipment can't manage it. In other words, the energy exceeded the capacity of that equipment. Well, so we have to make sure in the code, it says, listen, you got to make sure equipment is suitable for the available fault that's going to take place. Now, the National Code is not a maintenance standard. This is a problem. In order to have a safe electrical system, okay, in order for it to be practically, for, in order to practically try to make something safe, right, like, so that you can fly a plane across the ocean and you can drive a car and you can turn on electricity. It doesn't mean you're not going to get killed, but to try to keep it as safe as possible side here, you have to maintain it. 
Imagine an airplane is not maintained, right? Imagine a car that's not going to be maintained. Imagine an electrical system that's not going to be maintained. Every single day it's degrading. We're not following the instructions. And that then leads into, a, into billions of electrical connections around the United States and electrical insulations of, of a, millions of electrical insulations that are continuously degrading and failing as we go along. So you as an electrical professional, if you're an electrician, electrical contractor, inspector, it, by us understanding what should it look like so it, it's safe, then we can at least alert people, say, hey, listen, that's not a safe application. But we need to know what is considered relatively safe. So the code is not maintenance. We've seen this all over the place. Here is a, know, a box sitting here with the wires exposed. And probably that's energized. Probably it's Ooh. not GFCI protected. Here's a person like, okay, well, that wasn't going to hold. <laughs> so they say, okay, well, I don't... I get her done. You know what I mean? Well, there's a reason that it's not holding in there. The Saturday night special right there. <laughs> <laughs> Here, making a splice. I've, we're hoping these were not electrical people. This is just somebody who doesn't understand and trying to make something work. Clearly, failures. I mean, we see lots of, this is not like one in a million. This, this is stuff that people are seeing all the time, that somebody doesn't understand what they're doing there. Here's the haircut we talked about, a little nicer job. It's a very nice job at a haircut, yeah, though. Yeah, you, you can't deny that, you know. Yeah. So, that's a nice one. Trimmed well, down. here's copper-clad aluminum, by the way. Yes. Oh, Where does the phone. code say you can't do this? Um, uh, it, that's a really good question. i surprised a lot of electricians ask me that. Okay. The rule that I would say would be 110.3b, equipment must be installed in accordance with listing and yes. labeling instructions. <clears throat> Nowhere in there... Would, that that product was designed to be cut. You're not installing oh. that product in a cord. They'll, they'll tell you how to terminate conductors, right? They'll tell you you, you you cut it this size and you take the insulation off seven eighths of an inch and you know but nothing. And it might even tell you about being careful about nicking the the insulation. They might even make a comment about nicking the insulation of the conductor when you're using the when you're cutting the ins, when you're cutting off the uh, sheathing the, 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 the insulation sheathing. You know so. It's a product standard. It's not a code rule saying. Now, one could argue that, well, you know, the wire was rated so many amps at a certain size wire. Well, Mike, I can recalculate this wire so it's not a 4 aught anymore. It's a 2 aught. You know what I mean? You know, so. But you're right. Um, that would be the best we have. Oh, Eric? Yeah, the other thing I've, I've heard is uh, what kind of wire is it? What size is it? I started off with a 4 aught, but if I haircut it, what is it? And if, and if the NEC, if everything's based on design, and you say, okay, you're using a 4-aught or you're using a 2-aught, well, you can put a system together like that. But if you start cutting strands off, you, know, you now no longer, it's no longer a conductor. It's a something, but it's not a conductor. Uh, you know what? We all recognize clearly this product is not being installed. Well, and maybe we can make I, it public. I would, I would say... Obviously, we don't all recognize that clearly because this is a very prevalent problem. <laughs> Doesn't okay. fit under the law. Okay. And, Give it a haircut. And I will say this, that uh, until whatever class, yours or somebody else's, I was in and somebody pointed this out, oh. you could have never convinced me that this was a problem because <laughs> what if I put in a bigger wire than I was required to have? And, and I would think, well, there's no problem. I got plenty of copper there still to take a few strands off. You know what? And it doesn't say it in the code that you can't do it black and white. You know what? This brings up a great point. And uh, Joe, I know you wanted to talk about this. And that is this, that sometimes the obvious is not obvious to the people who are working in the field, right? But right. it's obvious to us. But there's no rule that says you can't, specific rule, give me the code sex. And we, well, we got to use kind of an obscure rule. I'm going to submit a public input. See, the way the National Code is constructed is people submit, hey, I think you should change this. Well, why? Well, because I think that you should be able to tell people that when you have a wire, that you're not able to do a haircut, whatever you want to call that, and they, you have to, that, 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 and then write the language. So I'm going to submit a public input for the 2023 code to make it specifically clear and then get the right language in there. Well, I mean, 110.14 tells us that we can't use solders and fluxes and inhibitors. Not that any of us have any clue what that is for the most part, but it doesn't tell you that you can't trim strands off of a conductor when you're terminating it. So 2023, those of you watching this videotape, hopefully you'll be around. You're going to see, I'm sure that we're going to get that public input passed and there'll be a clear rule that would tell you that is prohibited.